Welcome for the afternoon. Welcome uh, to the afternoon session. Our speaker is Chris Bishop, who talk about dimensions of transcendental Julia said. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so this is mostly a survey of other people's work and a little bit of a recent work of myself, but for the last couple of years, the last two years, I've been working on things that were not really holomorphic dynamics. And so I don't have any brand new shiny uh, things to tell you about. Uh, the plan for today is to uh, review a little bit about Hausdorff and packing dimensions, which I expect you know, and to say a little bit about the differences uh, between the polynomial and the transcendental case, and then to talk about um, different examples uh, that are probably well known, but maybe not to everyone, uh, where the dimension is two or the dimension is between one and two. This is the work of uh, Glenn Stallard, or dimension equal to one, which is the most uh, recent work uh, by myself and also. Um, there's a new, new approach by uh, uh, Kirill uh, Lezebdik and uh, Jack Burkhardt. And then I hope I have time at the end to uh, mention some open problems. And so that's probably the most, uh, the most interesting thing. So to remind you, the Minkowski dimension of a set counts how many boxes you need of a certain size. So you take a certain epsilon size and you just count the boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, how many boxes you need, that's the number N of K. And you divide the log of that by the log of epsilon. And so what you're thinking of is that the number of boxes sort of looks like epsilon to a power and the ratio of logarithm picks that out. And if this limit exists, uh, we call that the Minkowski dimension, but usually the Minkowski dimension does not exist, uh, but the limb soup always does exist. And that's the upper Minkowski dimension. And that's something that we talk about more regularly. And so this is also called the box counting dimension. This is uh, sort of the most naive, the most uh, easy to understand dimension. It does have a couple of unfavorable properties though. Uh, the first thing is it's not defined for unbounded sets. If you have an unbounded set, and even if epsilon is one, you take an infinite number of boxes to cover the set. And so what you're doing is you're taking infinity over log of epsilon, and that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't give you a number, that just gives you infinity. So it's not gonna be defined for unbounded sets. Also for certain countable sets, like just a sequence of one over N, you can prove that the Minkowski dimension that is one half uh, because it takes about root N balls of size one over N to cover that sequence. Uh, but really it's, it's a countable sequence of zero dimensional sets. We'd like to be zero dimensional. And so the fix up Minkowski dimension, we define packing dimension and there's several ways of doing it, but sort of the easiest uh, thing is where you just take a set and you break it up into pieces. So you break it up into a countable number of pieces, A1, A2, A3, and so forth. And then you take the supremum of the Minkowski dimensions of all of those. And so because you can take an unbounded set and break it up into a countable number of bounded pieces, uh, there's some chance that this will make sense for even for unbounded sets. And if you have a countable set, like a set of points, you just take your pieces to be one point each. Each of them has dimension zero. And so the packing dimension would be dimension zero the way we want. And so, uh, so packing dimension is usually what we use instead of Minkowski dimension directly. It has some nicer properties. Um, the most typical dimension though is the Hausdorff dimension. This is probably what most people know. It differs from the Minkowski dimension because you cover the set by squares of different sizes. You can use big squares or small squares. In Minkowski dimension, we're covering by squares of all the same size. But in Hausdorff dimension, you're allowed to cover by squares of different size. What you're trying to do is minimize the diameters of those sets uh, to some power alpha. And if alpha is very large, for example, in the plane, if it's bigger than two, this will be zero. This infimum can be made as small as you want but there's some critical exponent at which you cannot make it zero anymore. That's the Hausdorff dimension. So I'm saying this pretty quickly with the idea that um, most people attending a conference on complexity of Julia sets know what uh, the different fractal dimensions are, but it seems worthwhile to, to mention them. Also because I'm gonna be interested later on in the possibility that the Hausdorff dimension and the packing dimension are different. Now the Hausdorff dimension is always less than the packing dimension, but you can have strict inequality sometimes. And there's some well-known examples of this, but um, some examples come up very naturally in dynamics. And so we'll talk about those a little bit as we go on, okay? 
Now for polynomials, uh, the Hausdorff dimension can take any value between zero and two. So there's the uh, famous picture of the Mandelbrot set here. I actually had a picture, a computer generated picture of the Mandelbrot set, but uh, this was when my talk, I timed it out to be about 80 minutes long. And I said, well, that's a little bit longer than 50. So I should cut things. And one of the things I cut was a picture of the Mandelbrot set. But what I intended to use it for was that if you had points in a parameter space, which are far away, that the dimension is close to zero of the Julia set. But it gets closer to two as you get closer to generic points in the Mandelbrot set. So if Shishikori is here, he can explain this. This is his theorem that you can get all the numbers up to and including two. The same is true for meromorphic functions. And I believe uh, Walter already spoke about that uh, yesterday. Uh, what I wanna talk about are transcendental entire functions, so no poles. And in this case, uh, the Hausdorff dimension has to be between one and two. And uh, the, the point of my survey today is to basically sketch a proof of this, to show that the dimensions have to be bigger than one, and then to give examples where they're equal to two, strictly in between one and two, and equal to two. And we will become less and less rigorous as we go on. So the proof for dimension two will be pretty straightforward. I'll sort of give the details for in between one and two, and I will wave my hands very vigorously um, for dimension equal to one. Okay, the idea is that for polynomials, getting, getting numbers close to two is what's difficult and getting a positive area Julia set is hard. In transcendental entire functions, getting two is relatively easy. Most of the easy examples like the exponential function have that property, but forcing the dimension smaller is what becomes difficult. And so getting dimension one is in some sense kind of the analog anal analogous thing to getting dimension two for a polynomial. All right. So let me just run through an old theorem of Baker that the Hausdorff dimension always has to be bigger than or equal to one. So we'll do this in a couple of steps, All right? So to begin with, a non-trivial loop escapes. So suppose we have a piece of the Julia set. And by a loop, I mean a closed loop in the Fatou set, which surrounds it, okay? And the claim is then that this iterates of this loop have to go off to infinity, okay? Well, suppose that they don't. If the iterates stayed bounded on this loop, then by the maximum principle, the iterates would also be bounded on the interior. So what you'd have is a normal family. Okay, and so you would be in the Fatou set. So if the iterates were bounded on the loop, then the entire interior loop is in the Fatou set. That contradicts the fact that you're surrounding the Julia set. So that can't happen. So some point, some point on the loop has to escape to, and has to be unbounded at least, maybe not escape to infinity, but it can't stay bound. It has to, it has to go out some distance. Um, but if one point escapes, then uh, by normality, they will, they will all escape. And so uh, the, the, the points on by the normal, by normal families, if you're any point on this loop, it's also going to escape. So these, you may find some gaps in these arguments. This is a sort of a sketch of how it goes, um, but I'm, I'm just trying to give the feel for, for how it goes. And so don't yell at me if I've left out a step here or two, okay? Uh, the next uh, lemma is that how does it escape? So if you have a, a piece of the Julia set and it's surrounded by a loop, well, this loop could just sort of go off, say, to the right like this, escape to infinity that way. Or it could escape to infinity by sort of becoming larger and larger, like this. And the second thing happens. So the claim is, is that um, you have non-zero index around the origin. So if the loops simply escaped by sort of shifting themselves, they would not surround the origin. They would not have non-zero index. So non-zero index means that you wind around the origin at least once. If you don't wind around the origin, if you're sort of, sort of this picture over here, then there are no zeros on the boundary and you can show that a minimum principle applies. And so the interior actually escapes. And so that's a contradiction. If you're surrounding the Julia set, uh, your interior cannot escape to infinity because the Julia set is the closure of fixed points, the repelling fixed points, and they don't have unbounded orbits. And so that would be a, a contradiction again. And so hence the iterates actually sort of expand out. The, the iterates of the loops have to expand this way. They surround every compact set in the plane eventually. We're about halfway there now. So suppose that we have, so, so the next lemma is that multiply connected for two components have to be bounded, all right? Well, suppose not. Suppose I had an unbounded 
the two component sort of looks like this. Maybe there's some holes in it. But it's a multiply connected uh, the two component that goes on forever. And suppose that I had a loop in here that surrounded a piece of the Julia set. Now, what we just said was that this, maybe the origin is, eh, here's the origin saying, the iterates of this get larger and larger. They go, go out to infinity, but they surround, but they surround uh, the origin. What that means is they have to keep hitting omega. Omega is going off to infinity here. And these iterates are surrounding the origin. So they're going to constantly hit omega. But if these loops hit omega, they're in the Fatou set. They have to be inside omega. So in fact, all the iterates are actually inside omega. So my picture of omega was kind of mistaken. It doesn't just look like a strip. Omega actually has to contain big loops that go around, uh, go around the origin. So it's more like omega sort of looks like the complement of this. And these loops are, are surrounding uh, things in here. Now, if you have two of these loops that go around it in omega, we can connect them by some path that's inside this component. And when we iterate, when we apply F and this loop goes over here, this loop goes to the next loop that's further out. And this connecting path gets mapped to something else. And what we get is, is that the hyperbolic distance between the successive iterates stays bounded. In fact, by the Schwartz inequality, um, it, it, it has to stay bounded because the hyperbolic distance doesn't, uh, doesn't go up. And so what this means is that we can prove from this, again, I'm skipping a step here, is that the diameter of each loop is at most a constant times the diameter of the previous loop. And from that, again, st skipping one or two steps, this implies that F must be growing at most polynomially. Okay, because if it was growing faster than polynomially, the diameters of these curves would actually be increasing faster than, uh, faster than this. And so again, I've left out a, a couple of calculations and steps here, but this implies that we got a contradiction. And what, would, what did we contradict? We contradicted that there was an unbounded multiply connected for two component. And so all the multiply connected for two components are bounded. And now we're done with the dimension estimate because the claim is that any Julia set of a transcendental entire function must contain a continuum that is a connected set with at least two points in it. If it contains a continuum, the dimension is at least one. And why is this? Well, suppose that this, the Julia set didn't have it. That would mean the Julia set was a, a, a totally disconnected Cantor set. That means that the Fatou set would be the outside of a Cantor set. So it would be one single multiply connected component that goes on forever because there's only one of them. It has to cover the whole plane minus the Julia set. And the Julia set is not a neighborhood of infinity. Um, and so we get a contradiction. And so the Julia set must contain a continuum. And so the dimension is always at least one uh, because of this. And so this argument is, uh, is due to Baker. Uh, someone who knows the history better can, uh, can, uh, can correct me if I've, I've made a mistake here. Any questions so far? Okay. Can anyone hear me? Or did you make an early start on the walk? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, someone is still there. Okay. Um, so this is why the dimension is always at least equal to one. And so now what I'd like to do is briefly explain why you can get all the numbers between one and two. So as I said, we'll do dimension two, and then we'll talk about uh, Gwyneth Stallard's uh, proof that you can get between one and two. And finally, the more recent work that you can get dimension one. And as I said, things sort of get harder as we try to go down in dimension. Well, several famous examples have dimension equal to two. The, uh, the Julia set of the exponential function is the whole plane. So that definitely has dimension two. And even if you take a, um, a multiple of it, for example, if you choose lambda sm you know, smaller than one, then this has a fixed point, an attracting fixed point. So there's definitely some for two uh, component there. Uh, you can get dimension two in area zero. Uh, what I think the easiest one to explain though, is just taking the cosh function and proving that it has a positive area. That certainly implies dimension two. So I put down a couple of slides to explain why this last uh, case holds. First, I have to talk about the escaping set. The escaping set I sort of mentioned briefly before without defining it, it's the set of points that iterate out to infinity. In general, 
the Julia set is the boundary of the escaping set for any uh, entire function. But if you're in what's called the aramenko lubitsch class, then it's the closure. And so in particular, the escaping set is inside the Julia set. The aramenko lubitsch class are the functions that have uh, bounded a singular set. So a singular set being the closure of the critical points and the finite asymptotic values. I don't know if anyone has defined uh, these classes uh, this week, but I expect, um, I expect someone has. So later on, I'm going to talk, refer a little bit to the Aramaic Lubitsch class. It's the functions which have a bounded singular set into the Spicer class, uh, the functions that have a finite uh, singular set. Okay. Do I have to say more about this or are we okay? All right. So uh, here's a, a much easier slide, which is describing what the exponential function looks like. So the exponential function takes half strips and maps them. Um, to the outer half plane, the, 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 the complementary uh, strip over here is mapped into the disk. The most important thing we want to know is though that the, uh, if you take a, a piece of it like this, it's mapped to an annulus that goes around like this, okay? So I think everyone, hopefully everyone at a complex dynamics conference knows what the exponential function does. The Cauch function is almost the same thing. It's basically just the exponential function. And then you follow it by the Drakowski map. And so it maps half strips, the complement of a line segment, but it has the nicer property that instead of mapping the complementary half strip over here uh, into the disk, it also maps that half strip to the complement of a segment. So the cosine, the Cauch function is more or less um, uh, invariant under reflection across the imaginary axis, not quite the actual rule is this one, but both sides of the strip get mapped to the half plane. So in particular, a neighborhood of the imaginary axis gets mapped to a neighborhood of the segment and things which are far to the left or far to the right uh, get mapped very far away from the origin, exponentially far away. And so that's what we do. So we think of the plane as sort of made up of a grid of squares which are two pi by two pi. Each of these squares gets mapped to an annulus which wraps all the way around and is much bigger. If this square is about n units over from the origin, this scale is e to the n. So it's an immense square. And in this big annulus, you can fit many, many, many uh, squares. In fact, you can fit about e to the two n uh, pi size squares into it. Now, what we're gonna do is we're going to throw some of these away we're gonna throw away the ones which are too close to the origin within N of the origin. So that throws away about um, N times E to the minus N of the area of the annulus. And then we have to throw away some of the squares which hit the boundary because we wanna be inside the annulus. But that throws away fewer, that only throws away about E to the minus N of the area. So what's left after we throw away the, the piece on the, along the vertical axis, along the edge is most of the area. What we're throwing away in fraction is only um, n times e to the minus n of the area. The rest of the area stays. And then we can take each of these squares and iterate them. And they go to another annulus and those have squares and we can iterate those. And we're throwing away a tiny, tiny fraction each stage. So with positive probability, a square iterates to here. We throw away a tiny fraction of it. The rest iterates further out to another. We can cover that by squares and so forth. And so it's pretty easy to see that positive area escapes. And because the cosh um, is in the Spicer class, it only has um, two singular values. This, um, this, uh, this is in the Julia set. And so we get area is bigger than zero or dimension is equal to two. And so this is the easiest example I know uh, to check this, right? And that's a more or less uh, complete argument uh, for that. Um, when we wanna get below two, things get rather more complicated. And so we're gonna move from sort of giving a more or less complete uh, proof to giving a kind of a hand wavy sketch of this. And so this, um, these examples are due to Gwyneth Stallard. Um, the presentation I'm gonna make is my own. So any mistakes are my fault, not hers, obviously. Um, moreover, uh, she and Phil had proven uh, that when you're in the aramenko lubitsch class, the packing dimension is always equal to two. And her examples are in that class. And so in particular, that 
the Hausdorff dimension, the packing dimension are gonna be different for all of these examples. And so I mentioned before that this can happen and it happens fairly naturally in, um, in transcendental dynamics. And this is, a, this is a case where this happens. Now, being in the aramaico lubitsch class means that the, um, the set of singular values of the function is a bounded set. And you can ask, can you still make these examples if you're in the Spicer class where you only have a finite number of singular values? So recently, uh, Simon Albrecht and I uh, did construct such examples, but we give a sequence of functions so that the Julia sets of these, these, these sequences tend towards one. We can get as close to one as we want, but we don't show that we can get everything. So basically, if here's one and here's two, you can get all of this in the aramaico lubitsch class, but so far we only know that we can get as close as we want. And so um, at the end of the open, uh, end of the talk when I, when I wanna talk about open questions, uh, one of the questions will be, can you actually get all the, can you fill in all these gaps within the Spicer class? So I have an idea for how you might do that, but um, that is not worked out yet. So that, that, that's still a problem to, uh, to be considering. So how do, um, how do the examples with dimension between one and two work? So it basically starts with a strip, okay? And what I wanna do is find a uh, aramaico lubitsch function that has a tract. Now a tract just means the place where the function is bigger than one. So the idea in this picture is that F is gonna be less than one outside the track and it's gonna be bigger than one inside the track. And in fact, as you go down the track, this thing is gonna to go to infinity very, very fast, okay? Uh, outside the tract, it's just gonna be bounded uh, by one. And so there's several ways of constructing an aramaico lubitsch function that has this basic property. Uh, in, in, in Gwen's paper, I believe she used a version of the, um, of the Cauchy integrals uh, uh, formula to, to construct such a function. Uh, I also know uh, I, you can do it by basically taking the function, which is zero here, and what you want in the strip, it has a discontinuity across the boundary, but there's a method called solving the Debar equation, which lets you um, fix basically this discontinuity. And uh, this function will give you an aramaico lubitsch class function, which will be good enough for this proof to work. Um, personally, because of my own recent work, I prefer using something called quasi-conformal folding or the model's theorem for the Ar Ar aramaico lubitsch class, which just says if we draw this picture of the strip, um, then basically the model's theorem will hand you an aramaico lubitsch function, which is bounded on the outside of the strip and goes to infinity inside the strip, just as you wish. I did have some slides on this. Um, that was part of the 80 minute version of this talk. And so they're gone now in the, in the hopefully 50 minute version of the talk. But uh, if you were at my um, uh, talk at Lumini last week, I talked a little bit about uh, this model's theorem that given a tract of a function, you could build an aramaico lubitsch class thing, which um, basically had, had this picture for its track. In fact, we can be a little more specific about what that function uh, will look like. So we're going to build a function which has a fixed point at the origin. Around the origin, things get attracted into it. Our half strip, we're gonna move over here to the point um, x equals k. So we sort of shifted the half strip over so it's not near the attracting fixed point. And since the function is bounded by one outside the strip, everything outside the strip is going to eventually iterate into this fixed point. Things in the strip could iterate to other points in the strip, or they might iterate out, in which case they would go to the origin. But the Julia set is going to be inside the strip. And inside the strip, the function looks like basically e to the e to the z minus k. And what this means, I, I like pictures, so. This is too much like a formula for me. In pictures, what this says is that we're gonna take the strip and map it to a half plane. And that mapping basically is we take the strip and we back the line k, k up to zero and then we exponentiate. So the e to the minus k part is the mapping of the strip to the half plane. And then you follow it by the exponential map, which takes the half plane to the outside of the disk. So this mapping was chosen just because it does this. It's the mapping of the half strip to a half plane, followed by the mapping of the half plane to the, ex to the outside of the disk. And so these are two mappings we understand very, very well. And we can, uh, we can do what we, uh, what we need to do, okay? 
Now, the Julia set are going to be things whose iterates stay inside the strip forever because once they land outside the strip, they get attracted to the fixed point at the origin. So we're looking for things whose iterates always stay inside the strip. And so more precisely, the Julia set is the intersection of the XNs where the XNs are simply the things whose iterates stay inside the strip for K steps. So not only do they have to stay inside the strip, they also have to stay to the right of this line X equals K, because again, if they're land on the left side of this, they will iterate to the fixed point at, it, at the origin, okay? Now, how do we compute the Hausdorff dimension of the points who, which iterates never leave the strip? Well, what we wanna do is basically cover the strip by boxes. And this covering by boxes, we're gonna cover the Julius, it has to have two properties. If we wanna show the dimension is less than one plus delta, we have to show that the diameters of these boxes sum, have a finite sum when we raise them to the one plus delta power, okay? The second step is that if we take one of these boxes and we look at all of its pre-images, so if we take one of this, these boxes and then we look at it over here, and then it's gonna have a bunch of pre-images in the half plane, and those are gonna have pre-images in the strip, that when we sum the diameters of all of those pre-images for one box, we get something which is less than we started with. And so this is a way of taking a covering and then taking its pre-images to get a, a, a finer covering. And the Hausdorff sum is smaller than the sum we began with. So every time we refine the covering, the, uh, the sum goes down. And so uh, this is a standard way of, of giving an upper bound for the dimension of something. And the main thing is that we wanna be able to take this number a small, smaller than one, certainly. But in fact, you can take it as small as you wish if you take this K large enough. And we can do this because now it's a pretty a simple calculation. It's almost a calculation you could give to an undergraduate complex analysis class. Um, what does the pre-image of a disk look like? Well, if you'd start with a disk somewhere in the plane, kind of far away from the origin, uh, here, let me highlight it, uh, my highlight. So here's my disk over here. The exponential map is periodic. So the pre-images of this disk is a whole vertically stacked line of disks, it looks like this. And then the pre-images of these disks under the mapping from the strip to the half plane, well, this is a conformal map, it's one-to-one. -one. So this line here simply becomes a line of disks like this. And the idea is I wanna sum the diameters of all of these and compare it to diameter of the one I started with. But the mapping is an exponential function here and an exponential function here. So this mapping is expanding a lot. So when I take the inverse images of the disk, these disks are much smaller by an exponential factor. And then I do this again, each of, whoops, what happened? Sorry, I accidentally changed the scale. And each disk here maps to something which is exponentially smaller here. So these disks are incredibly smaller than the disks we started with. So this should not be very hard uh, to do. And in fact, um, because the inverse map is basically the logarithm and the derivative of the logarithm is one over Z, uh, we have a formula that if we start with something of radius R, the pre-images in the middle here, they have size R over mod W. So you take the radius and divide by how far from the annulus you are, sorry, and that gives you the first step. Now, once you're here and you're going backwards again, this map is also a logarithm. It's the inverse of a uh, exponential. And so you get to take the radius here and divide by the distance to the origin. And here, basically, the distance to the origin is how high you are. So here, what you get to do is you get to divide by a factor of k, where k is how many steps up you are. And the secret is, well, sum of 1 over k is finite, is infinite. That would be infinite. But we get to raise the whole thing to a power bigger than 1. And so this is going to be a a sum of one over k to the delta. And so this is going to be all right. And so if you work out the arithmetic, here's the arithmetic worked out in a little bit more detail. But basically it says that if you take a disk and take its pre-images under two exponential maps and sum the diameters of what you get, it's much, much, much smaller than what you started with. And this is what uh, proves that you can, um, this is basically the estimate that proves that you have dimension as close to one as you want. So I have not proven that um, you get all dimensions, 
I've just shown you you can get dimensions that are close to one, but, uh, but Gwyneth in, in her papers did show that by doing a continuous variation of this picture, you can actually attain all the dimensions between one and two. So you can get everything uh, in here. Okay. Oh, here was my attempt to draw a picture of uh, this set. This is a, basically, I just took um, this ex double exponentiated map and I put it in MATLAB and I said, iterate points until they leave the strip and color them white. And if after 10 or 11 iterations, they haven't left color them blue, and this is the picture you get, it's not a very good uh, picture. I'm sure Arnaud could tell me how to draw a much better picture of this example. Uh, in general, I don't understand how to draw effective pictures of transcendental Julia sets. I would really uh, like to do that better. So um, I think that's a whole area uh, of, um, that, that there's a few experts in that, uh, like Lhasa can, can draw pictures, I think, and, and Arnaud Sheratop, but uh, other than that, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, the skill set limited to very, very few people. I would like to see more pictures like this. Now, uh, Simon and I had shown you can get these dimensions very close to, um, to one in the Spicer class. And so um, for many years, I thought the argument was, will you just take the argument we just did due to, to the Gwyneth, but now just take a Spicer class function, uh, which is growing to exponent, which sort of looks like e to the e to z in the strip and looks like it's less than one outside the strip and then just repeat the proof we just had. Um, because the quasi-conformal folding theorem ought to, um, ought to give you this. But it was Simon who pointed out to me that in fact, you can't. The folding theorem does not uh, allow you to do this. And in fact, not only does the folding theorem break down for this particular um, tract, there's no track, there, there's no Spicer function, which in a precise sense has a single track, which looks anything like a, uh, a strip. You can't even make it look like a quasi-conformal image of the strip. So if you try to re replace it by anything which was a, a, a planar quasi-conformal image of a strip, there's still no Spicer class function that, that has that for a track. And so this picture is sort of out um, for doing it. You don't have to go very far though. The problem with this track is that the complement is too large. If you look at the complement in the half plane, it sort of looks like a sector of angle two pi. So the strip is basically looks like a line and the outside looks like it, it has an angle of two pi, that's too big. But if you draw a picture like this, where the angles of the complementary components are less than pi, then you can use folding uh, to create a Spicer class function that basically looks like the right thing. It basically looks like e to the e to the z inside a finite union of tracks going to infinity. And it's bounded by one on all the other complementary tracks. And again, there is a, uh, an attracting fixed point at the origin. Everything in the white regions is attracted to here. And so now the problem is just to estimate what happens to points in these strips, which can now just iterate down the strips. Maybe they can jump to another strip, but they have to stay inside this union of, of, of half strips forever. And um, unfortunately, um, uh, Estimating this is a little bit harder. Uh, to, to apply the folding theorem, you can't just take a regular strip with straight edges. You have to add in vertical stripes here. Um, basically, what you need is that when the white region maps to a half plane, you want these points on the boundary to go to evenly spaced points on the half plane. And when you map the inside, to a half plane, you want those same points to also go to an evenly spaced sequence on the half plane. Now, the trouble is inside the strip, the map looks like e to the e to the z, and on the outside, it looks like a power of z because it's a sector. And it's rather hard to make a double exponential look exactly like a power function. And so what you, what the, what you do is that these strips basically um, are putting strips in here and then when you undo the strips, uh, you can actually force these two functions to be more or less equivalent. And so there's some, some dozens and dozens of pages of estimates uh, going into this. I won't uh, go into a great detail here. The point is, is though that when you take the pre-image of a, of a disk, so you would take a disk over here, 
and we want to know what its pre-images look like, they sort of follow the boundary like they did before. But now the boundary has these loops, and so the pre-images actually go up and down like this. They sort of follow around the boundary. And so there are many estimates estimating, well, how far apart are these vertical strips? How tall are they? Things like this. And so it does work out in the end. Um, you can get this. And the number, of, the number of strips going off to infinity, this n, this gets larger and larger as we want the dimension to get smaller and smaller. So we only get a sequence of dimensions, which is tending towards one. And so I, we don't yet know how to make this sequence into a continuous family because there's sort of an obvious, I mean, the star sort of imposes an obvious discrete property that there's only a, only a certain finite number of, of, of strips going off to infinity. If there's some way to make this sort of a, into a more continuous like family, that would maybe work, but um, at present, kind of stuck on that one. Finally, we get to a dimension equal to one. And here I will say a very little. Um, I given an example where you could actually get both the Hausdorff and the packing dimension equal to one. Uh, my, my example is based on infinite products. It's, uh, it's somewhat technical. Uh, there's a new more geometric proof uh, by Jack and Kirill. I don't know if, um, if they've spoken about that yet, but it's, it's in the works and it is coming. Both proofs are based on a similar geometry. So I'm gonna speak so vaguely that, that the next couple of slides apply to both examples together really. Um, the idea is to imagine you have an entire function, which is like a cartoon of an entire function. We cut the plane up into a number of annuli, like I've shown here. And then you, what we're gonna think of is each annulus maps to the next one, okay? And so each of these annuli, you should sort of think of as one of these escaping multiply connected for two components. And each one maps to the next one by a power function. But we're basically taking powers that are getting larger and larger. So it's not a single polynomial. We have like a z to the fourth, and then a z to the eighth, and then a z to the 16th, and then z to the 32nd, and so forth, okay? At the origin, well, you can think of the origin as maybe being an attracting fixed point. So things actually get sucked in there. In practice, we usually use something else. Maybe we use some kind of polynomial um, near the origin so that there's some Julia set and some Fatou set near the origin. So we want around the origin, we want to make sure that there's some Julia set here and also some Fatou sets. We want, um, we want something interesting to be going on at the origin. And then away from the origin, uh, the rest of the plane is sort of iterating off to infinity. Now, this is not an entire function, right? because if I have z to the fourth on one annulus and z to the eighth on the other one, there's a pretty bad discontinuity along, along this. But again, we can just think mentally of sort of smoothing this off. So near the center of the annulus, it really does look like a power very, very closely with a little tiny, tiny error. But near the edges of the annuli, well, it only looks like a power approximately, okay? And this is sort of the mental picture to, to have in mind for these examples, okay? Now, the way I create my examples is by, as I said, an infinite product. And so in my examples, the, um, the zeros are located very symmetrically. They're evenly spaced around these boundaries. And as you go out, you place more and more of them, okay? And so basically when you're out here, when you're say a point here, you see all these zeros, you see four and eight. So you see about Z to the two to the N zeros, which are further into, into the origin than you are. And if you're standing out here, you see the next power, you see it's like Z to the two to the N plus one because of the next generation of things. And the scale is way, way, way off. I've drawn these annuli so they look like they're all the same modulus, but in fact, the modulus is increasing tremendously. So the real picture would have one boundary looks like this, and the other boundary is immense. It just looks like it fills the whole plane. And so when you're standing in the middle of one annulus, all the other annuli just look like they're a single point at zero. And all the annuli that are further out look like they're at infinity. So in the center of any annulus, you don't see anything except maybe for this one string of zeros, which is close to you, but everything else closer to the origin is really concentrated at just one point near the origin. And everything that's further away looks like it's 
near infinity. And so what this means is, is that because of the symmetric placement of these zeros, um, the annula, annulus looks like it's almost rotationally invariant. If I were to take and rotate by this much, the picture is basically unchanged. Um, you would say, well, this thing doesn't iterate here. It only goes halfway. But remember, on this scale, these points are really look like they're all concentrated at the origin. And when you rotate the origin, it doesn't change. These points are way out. Well, these points would also be symmetrically uh, invariant under this rotation, but they're very far out as well. So in some sense, these fit two components will look like they're almost rotationally invariant, at least under this small rotation. And so what we expect is that their boundaries are sort of periodic going around the origin. They should almost look circular. And the further out we go, the more, e the more zeros there are, sort of the more circular these boundaries should be. So this is in very big quotes. The boundaries should be almost circular. Now, the way that you uh, prove this, that this actually happens, is to notice that when you have these zeros, there's some, remember, there's some Julia set and some Fatou set near the origin. And if you have a zero, that means that the neighborhood of this zero is getting mapped to a neighborhood of the origin. So whatever is happening near the origin is being replicated around each zero. So there's some Fatou component and some Julia set around each of these points. Okay. Now the mapping, actually, the way it works is that the mapping takes the inner component of this annulus to the outer thing. This is our sort of looks like two to the z to the n map. But these zeros also get mapped. Their, their boundaries also get mapped out to these. That's that's what happens in this picture. Okay. Now what happens on the next annulus? Now this picture is replicated out here. Okay. So there's some zeros out here. And there's some Fatou component boundaries, some Julia set out here. And if we take the pre-image of these, they don't land here because these things go to the boundary. So these things must land somewhere else. So what we can deduce is, is that because of the zeros at the next stage out, there must be a second ring of boundary components of this Fatou component. All right. But that means that this Second ring out here also has a second ring. The same argument says there's not just one ring of, of components, there's a second ring. The pre-image of the second ring is going to be a third ring in here. But that means that all these layers have a third ring, and the pre-image of this third ring out here is going to be a fourth ring in this one. And so the picture, in a cartoon way, looks like this. Now, I just drew this by hand, uh, basically. This is not an actual picture of the two component, but this is topologically what this one will look like. So we can prove that uh, this is actually uh, the, the basic, basic picture. And the, the boundary curves is not quite a circle. Maybe it's a circle, I don't know how to prove that, but it is C1. So I'm able to prove that the limiting of these things is a, is a C1. That's basically because these rings of components are pre-images of things that are on a real live circle. I put them the zeros on a real circle. And I'm taking the pre-image under a thing that basically looks like a power plus a little tiny error. So the pre-images of these things lie on something. If there was no error, they would lie exactly on a circle. But there's a very tiny error. So they lie on a slight perturbation of the circle. But I can basically make that small. That epsilon looks like 2 to the minus 2 to the n. It's a very small error. And so uh, the, the, these, these components accumulate on something which is that at least C1, if not better. Now, one of the odd things is that I, I can't see how to prove it's C2 or anything better than this. So the technique um, sort of breaks down, but I suspect it is, it is smoother. I just don't know how, how to do that. So each Fatou component is bounded by a countable number of smooth curves, and hence it is uh, one-dimensional. And then you have to give another argument that say that the buried points, so this picture is sort of replicated inside each. So in each picture here, you have a sort of a similar picture that goes on. And then in each of these components, the picture goes on again. And so there are some buried points that are not on the, on the boundaries of any of these things, but you can show they have this very small dimension. They don't count. And so what we get is the dimension equal to one example. Now, there are lots and lots of uh, questions which I, I don't know how to do. Um, you could actually show this example I was describing as finite one-dimensional measure on the sphere. It's an unbounded 
thing on the plane. So these boundary curves have infinite length as you get in the plane. But if you think of them as accumulating, as small circles accumulating at infinity, the lengths actually are summable. And so this is a, has a finite length measure, but you can't put it on a rectifiable curve. If you try to connect up these, all these components by a curve, I prove that that has infinite length. And so I can't connect the, the, my example up onto a, a curve, but I can't prove that you can never do it. So this is a question. Can it lie on a rectifiable curve? If you want a meromorphic function, then the Julia set can lie on a line, which is just a, cur a circle going through infinity. And so that can happen for meromorphic. Um, now we just heard earlier in the week that any Jordan curve can be the boundary of a wandering domain. And so it's not an open question whether you can make it smooth or not. It's really just a question for these examples, the examples giving the minimal dimension one, whether you can make these boundary components uh, smooth or not. So I think that would be an interesting thing to investigate. Now, in terms of the packing dimension versus the Hausdorff dimension, um, this corner up here, the two, two corner, this is like the exponential function. This is the Miserevich and McMullen. And Stollard's examples were this line here. They were all the dimensions with a Hausdorff dimension is between one and two, and the dimension is equal to, packing dimension is equal to two. The dimension one example, which I described is this corner down here, and Jack Burkhart's thesis was showing that you could approximate anything here, given any point where here, say SS, you can get a, 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 an entire function whose Hausdorff dimension and packing dimension are both within epsilon of S. So somewhere near here, there is a, um, is an example, but are his examples really on the diagonal or are they slightly inside? That we don't know. I was very interested in this point here. Um, dimension, Hausdorff dimension one, but packing dimension two, can that happen? We don't have an example of that yet. Um, so basically fill in anything uh, here that's left green. Um, in general, uh, here's just a question about polynomials. I don't happen to know the answer. Maybe this is a known fact already. But for polynomial Julia sets, is it true that the Hausdorff dimension is always equal to the packing dimension? I asked a few people, um, but they didn't know the answer. Uh, but maybe this is a bigger group. So maybe someone here already knows um, this. Uh, probably if anyone knows it, they live in Poland. So um, I think there's a good chance of, of getting that one answered. Um, again, there was the questions about, can you take Spicer class functions do they take all dimensions in one and two? We only show an, a, um, a sequence uh, does. And the escaping set, remember, was inside the Julia set. For, so for these examples, the escaping set also has dimensions, which is getting close to one. But can it have dimension actually equal to one? I think that does happen. I was thinking of assigning that to a graduate student. I have a kind of an idea how it might work. So um, that one I'm hopeful about. Um, now, Aramenko and Lubitsch show that if you take a Spicer class function, f, and you consider all the functions you can get by pre and compost composing by a quasi conformal mapping to get a new holomorphic mapping, this forms a finite dimensional manifold. These are the things that are called quasi conformally equivalent to f. And so the dimension of the Julia, so these sort of form a, a manifold. You take an f and then you, do, you, you take these deformations and it sweeps out some finite dimensional manifold. And the dimension is a function on this manifold. And usually the function is just equal to two, the constant two. If you take a, a Spicer class function that has finite order of growth, so it's growing no faster than e to the z to a power, then the Hausdorff dimension of the limit, limit set is two. And that's gonna be two no matter where you are in the space. So usually, very typically, this, con this, this dimension function is a constant function. But we know, um, because of the examples of Simon and myself, that there are some, some of these manifolds, some of these par parameter spaces, where at least it's less than two at one point. And here's a question. On those parameter spaces, is it constant, whatever that value is? Or is it non-constant? And if it's non-constant, does it always approach a dimension two or not? Um, for for quadratic polynomials, when we have the, 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 um, the Mandelbrot set, Shishikora had shown as you approach the boundary of the parameter space, at least you approach the boundary of the, the Mandelbrot set. So you approach, so there's a QC deformation equivalent space outside here. 
as you approach its boundary, you can get as close to two as you want. Does that argument apply somehow to these um, parameter spaces of Spicer class functions? Given any Spicer class function, can you always make quasi-conformal deformations so that the Julia set dimension goes to two? Is that supremum always two? If it was, then our examples show that all dimensions exist. So um, we could start with a dimension of a Spicer class function that was close to one, one plus epsilon. And if we could somehow use some kind of parabolic implosion or something to force the dimension up to two, then we would have shown that all the dimensions between one and two actually occurred. And so um, I'll just leave you with that thought. And that, that seems like it's a productive uh, line of questioning for the future. So thank you very much. If you have answers to any of these questions, please let me know. I would dearly like to understand them better. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for the. So, oh, I see there's still a few people in the audience. Okay. <laughs> a surprise, but very gratifying one. Um, were there any questions? Thank you for your inspiring talk. And are there questions, comments, solutions? First, from the audience, maybe? No? From online participants? So, if I was discussing your particular work, I hope you don't feel insulted or that I did a bad job. You certainly can break in at this point to. Uh, to make any corrections that are necessary. No, it was great, thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, maybe I have a remark, probably Gwyneth should uh, say this, but if I remember correctly, you have a paper, Gwyneth has a paper with Lasse Rampe where they prove that the dimension of the escaping set can be one for an entire function. Yeah, I so think that was, was in the Aramenko Lubitsch class. I was asking about the Spicer class. Oh, Spicer class. Okay, yeah, okay, so, okay, okay. Okay. Yes, okay if I'd okay. had 60 minutes to talk or 70 minutes or 110 minutes, I definitely would have tried to fill in all these other uh, things. Yeah, that yeah, I know. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yes. So there is, a, is an example in the Aramenko Lubitsch class mm -hmm. where the okay. dimension is equal to one. Basically, um, you can sort of use these perturbation methods to show. Mm -hmm that um, if you can make the Julia set dimension go down to one, then the escaping set is even smaller. And there, there's sort of an argument that says, well, the escaping set has to be equal to one in those examples. I don't know how to replicate that argument in the Spicer class. That's the sticking point. Like present, our Spicer class construction is very combinatorial. So mm -hmm. when we take one of our examples, it's determined by one of these folding trees, which is sort of a fixed combinatorics. And if you try to, to break the combinatorics, it's not clear what happens. You're sort of in a different moduli space of the Spicer class. And so um, maybe one little simple one sentence observation will be enough to, to do it, uh, but I haven't seen that. I, I think it's going to be difficult. It was embarrassingly hard to, um, to construct the examples of the Spicer class functions with dimensions going to one. Mm -hmm. uh, after I wrote my own folding paper, in the back of my head, I'd almost put in a paragraph in this paper that says, well, to get Spicer class functions with Julia sets close to one, dimension one, all you do is you take Gwen and Stallard's argument and you fold it. You just take the folding construction and apply it to her idea. And it obviously works. And uh, so what Simon's contribution was, it doesn't obviously work. In fact, it doesn't work at all. And so this was a bit of a shock to me because I had always just assumed that it did work. And, but he, he was right and I was completely wrong. And then it took us like a year or two years to actually work out the details of how to do it in the Spicer class. I showed you that picture of the star shaped um, track, but getting all the details worked out on that was, uh, uh, I was very proud of that paper. Um, it's very technical, probably no one will ever read it, but it was very satisfying to, uh, to get that nailed down. Okay, thanks. Chris, you, you, you hinted you had some idea how to get continuity. Um, well, um, so this was the, the thing I said at the end, that if you take, if you take a Spicer class function, you take these quasi-conformal deformations of it. And as you quasi-conformally deform it, the, 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 the Julia set dimension is going to change continuously because each Julia set is basically a quasi-conformal conjugate of the, of the other ones. Um, this has to be done a little carefully, but I, I think, for example, Lasse's uh, rigidity, he says you can improve a 
quasi-conformal equivalence to a quasi-conformal conjugacy on the Julia set. And so if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly from a few years ago, I think this implies that the dimension changes continuously as you move over these equivalence classes, these modulized spaces of quasi-conformal equivalent, equivalences. And I think that there's some hope of showing that when you're in a moduli class, there are ways of perturbing it that will cause the dimension to go up. So if you start with a small dimension, you can force it to continuously go upwards. And the inspiration for this would be Shishikura's argument that as you approach the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, you can force the dimension of the Julia set to go up to two. Basically because um, you can make, now here he should say something, but basically the idea is that where you have parabolic fixed points and where you have two sort of parabolic fixed points and they come very close to each other, you get something that looks very close to a rank two um, parabolic fixed point, which can't, well, anyway, things get very, very complicated very quickly. The Julia set becomes higher and higher dimensional as you approach certain uh, points on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. So I just have this vague hope, really. It's not really a proof. It's not really even a schedule of proof, but it's a hope that that kind of argument could be duplicated and that starting with any Spicer class function, you could find deformations of it in which basically some kind of version of parabolic implosion worked and the Julia set you could show would blow up to be two dimensional. So starting with a small dimensional set, there would be some general theorem that says you can always find quasi-conformal deformations to just make it worse, make the dimension go up to two. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, that's more of a, that is such a vague thing. I would never give it to say a graduate student for a thesis because I have no idea whether it could be made to work. But, um, but it, it seems like a, a sufficiently wild speculation that you guys can think of it while you're hiking in the woods to see if it, uh, see if it makes any sense at all. Um, but, but maybe, as I said, the, the Spicer class things have this combinatorial tree and doing the quasi-conformal equivalence doesn't really change that combinatorial tree, just how, how the things are put together. So yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm throwing things out here which are very speculative and I don't know how they're going, uh, which way they're going to go. I really don't have a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. You have a question, right? You, you raised your sure. hand. Uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to, you, you mentioned uh, this comment. So in, in your multiply connected wandering domains in the dimension one example, uh, you prove that there are C1, but we're wondering if, if they were better than C1. And in contrast, uh, Luca's results says you can get analytic boundaries, but uh, those are for simply connected wandering yes. domains. So I, I wanted to know if, uh, I mean, do, do you think if you can get analytic boundaries for simply connected wandering domains, does that also, do you think that translates also to multiply connected wandering domains? Can you also get uh, analytic boundaries if you don't care about uh, the dimension one part? I would think so. Um, we've already heard several talks this week about how to construct, you know, the wandering domains that you want, whether they be lakes of water or, or any Jordan curve. Uh, basically, you're taking the, the, the target domain you want and you're filling in the complement with a bunch, with a very chaotic mess. And so the thing that's outside the curve that you're interested in has all kinds of fixed points and for two components and Julia sets all sort of smashed in around the outside. Um, so probably, I don't see why you couldn't do something similar. Of course, these approximation techniques do use the simply connected, the idea that you can get so all these things are sort of based on Runge's theorem and Runge's theorem requires pole pushing that. You, you, you approximate things by rational functions whose poles can then just be pushed out to infinity to make it, a, make it holomorphic. And getting out to infinity requires that there's a path going to infinity. And so that, so this simply connectedness is sort of strongly built into the fact that you're basing the construction on, on a Runge type argument. I don't see how you can get around that. On the other hand, I don't have any reason for for thinking you can't get smooth um, boundaries components for a multiply connected region. Um, I might be a little bit more doubtful, you know, when you want dimension one, because then what it's saying is that the boundary of these for two components carries the, carries the dimension and any, anything you do outside the for two components to sort of force them to have a particular shape, like you're putting in all this extra attracting points or, or things on the outside, 
they have to have dimension less than one in order not to push the dimension above one. Um, that seems like it might be a quite a difficult constraint. Um, certainly you don't have much freedom about how to put the uh, put all the stuff on the outside. Um, but I haven't gone through these papers of Luca and the others to see how far that could be pushed. Um, I figured they have su such a huge head start on me thinking about that, that I would leave it to them to, uh, to sort that out. I do find it a little infuriating that, that we do understand these examples, the dimension one examples with the expanding circles pretty well. Uh, topologically, we know exactly what the, the combinatorics are and we know where the orbits go and you know, which orbits go back to the origin and which ones escape. And you know, we can sort of write down a symbol dynamics for, for everything. We can point to anything in the picture and say, what happens to that point? Um, but the, the estimates that I use and, and presumably you use in your paper with Jack um, are good for showing that we get a, a C1 convergence, that the tangents exist and the tangents move continuously. But showing those tangents move a little bit better than continuously, like even in C2, that my argument is so geometric, I don't see how to do that. It's sort of an argument about tangent lines and that if you have points near each other, the tangent lines have to be almost parallel to each other. Otherwise you get a contradiction. And so that implies that they're not, there's no jumps, they're moving continuously. But I don't see how to improve my argument to, to something better. Um, probably just have the wrong argument. Um, the, these, the, these boundary curves in some sense are the limits of circles under pre-images of z to the n plus a tiny error where the tiny error is really, really tiny. So they ought to be circular or very close to circular. And that point of view should be able to give you higher smoothness. The problem is that the boundaries are not the image of a circle under an arbitrarily good map. They're images of different circles under different maps and you're taking a limit of that. If somehow you were taking the image of a single circle under a single map, that would be easier to deal with. Um, so I'm babbling, I'm sorry, I don't mean to babble. Um, but yeah, I'm just personally frustrated on that, uh, that particular issue. More questions? So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you and uh, 